Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. Lifetime emotion was put into Life Happens on the Speakers. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. Hello, and welcome once again to the Emmett Blackwell Show. Thank you for listening, and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. On this episode, I'll be speaking with Breakthrough Novel award-winning author Amy Markstaller about her book, Life Happens on the Stairs. We talk about her journey, her characters, and the life experiences that inspired her book. So, without any further ado, let's begin. Life Happens on the Stairs by Amy J. Markstaller Elsie Richardson's world crumbles when her dad drops from a seizure at the 4th of July festival. The reality that his brain tumor is back with a vengeance slams a 17-year-old aspiring artist and her family into intense hardship. Her mom needs to help to make ends meet, forcing Elsie into adulting overnight. On top of that, Elsie's caustic, grunge-holding brother is on his way home, and Elsie fears he will only make matters worse. Feeling alone and hopeless, Elsie does as she's told and goes to work with her mom. That's when she meets Tyler Vaughn, the grandson of her mom's wealthiest client. After he invites her to go jogging at the historical Shiloh National Military Park, Elsie is warned by her mom to stay away from the wealthy young man. Elsie gets the notice a bit too late, and so she lies about who she's meeting each morning. Over the next few weeks, Tyler becomes her secret solace amidst all the uncertainty she's facing. But when reality strikes and her private world crashes, she's forced to find her inner strength on her own. Amy J. Markstaller's Life Happens on the Stairs will touch your heart in many ways. It's a hopeful story that reminds us of the miracle of love and family, and possibly of second chances. If you enjoy realistic fiction with a love story that will give you all the feels, this award-winning debut novel is a must-read. Get your copy of Life Happens on the Stairs by Amy J. Markstaller at Amazon.com. Hi there, and I am here with the author, Amy J. Markstaller. And hi, Amy, how are you doing today? I am doing fantastic. How are you? I am doing great. Now, when did you actually begin writing? Um, I would say it was, a, well, I wrote in high school. I wrote a lot of short stories. Um, I'm a girl from the cornfields, so, you know, I wasn't hanging out in town all the time. And I wrote a lot of stor- short stories um, when I was younger, but I kind of put down my pen for a while. And it wasn't until I had, you know toddler, heck, my kids were a little bit older, but probably around 2010, I sat down and tried to write my first novel and the plot fell apart and, you know, life kind of happened. And then um, in 2013, my son went to camp and I shipped my daughter off to uh, grandma's house. And for five days, I was able to sit down and start Life Happens on the Stairs, which was originally called the housekeeper's daughter. Hmm. Um, but I noticed that there's the beekeeper's daughter, the preacher's daughter, <laughs> you know, there were too many titles that were too reminiscent of it. And eventually life happens on the stairs came out of the body of the book. And, um, so I, 2013 is when I started this particular story. Wow. That's, that's pretty impressive. And you've won a few awards for your writing. Uh, what awards have you won? Um, I had entered quite a few Romance Writers of America contests, and the first one that gave me a good hit, those are, those are tough contests to enter, I have to say, to anyone out there. Um, 
I was recommended because it was a YA novel, you know, go to Romance Writers of America. They've got these great contests, and they do. Um, but um, after being shot down and getting some very raw feedback in 2016, um, I won third place in the Linda Howard Award of Excellence. Um, she writes romance, and I, I hate to confess, I've, I've never read Linda Howard's work. I have one of her books here that I do plan on reading, <laughs> but um, I had a friend this week, or not this week, it was this past summer, that she was like, you won the bronze for Linda Howard Award. <laughs> and I'm like, I... She's like, I've got a book. I'll give it to you. And I'm like, okay, thank you. Um, <laughs> and then um, I was signed with a small publisher, an independent publisher, earlier this year. But I had, at the same time, entered the Breakthrough Novel Award and honestly kind of forgot about it. Uh, come May, it was like, hey, you're a finalist. And I'm like, okay, great. And then in June, I won. Wow. And the Breakthrough Novel Awards has changed the course of everything. Yeah, it really does help set up those new contacts and, and really get your name out there. And yes. one person has helped you immensely, uh, and she's actually been on this show, uh, Eva Lancaster, who was your book manager. Um, how has that business relationship worked out for you so far? Eva is an angel. <laughs> she, first of all, her book, um, Being Indie, was brilliant. Um, when I first talked to her, I said, you know, I'm, I'm signed with a small independent publisher, but I would love to have, you know, the opportunity for you to market. And she basically said, will you read this book? And, you know, and she guided me in a way that ultimately I backed out of the contract with the small independent publisher because they weren't invested in me. Mm -hmm. It was... Um, I don't want to just bad mouth, but it was one of those that Eva and the judges had chosen Life Happens on the Stairs because of the story mm -hmm. and where the small publisher didn't necessarily, they weren't invested in the story. And so I took the steps to get my rights back and then go with Eva exclusively as my book manager and it it has worked out beautifully. It, she has been fantastic. I have a beautiful cover. She edited it. Um, we went line by line kind of edits, you know, uh, the promos. And she helped me set up my website and the Twitter pages and whatnot. I already had a Twitter establishment, but she, you know, just gave me some great promos to go along with it. And so this this partnership has been exactly what I was craving all along, mm -hmm. you know, like minds working to get to the, the like goal. Yeah. Cause it's almost like what you would imagine an agent would be. And then when you get into the biz, you realize that an agent is not at all what you thought it was. And I'm not saying exactly. anything bad about agents. Some agents are very dedicated to their authors are very in contact, but when you have one person who's a book manager, somebody who's more concerned about what's between the covers than what they are about how much money they're going to make on this project, um, you start to realize that when they focus on what's between the covers, they're already thinking of how to make money with this project because they have so much invested into it. And right there, I mean, just uh, Eva, I, I want to say uh, if if you're listening out there, I know you are. Uh you have brought some very amazing authors to this show, and I want to say to everybody out there, if you haven't thought about getting a book manager, think again, because they're better than an agent in a lot of ways. Um, check out Eva's book, Being Indie, and she gives away a lot of trade secrets that most agents would not give away on their first day. So anyhow, back to you, Amy. Um, I agree. 100%. <laughs> I agree. Eva was just brilliant behind us. Um, you know, I couldn't wait to see what the book cover was. That's like every author is like, oh, what's it going to look like? And <laughs> what's it going to feel like? I can't wait to hold it. But it wasn't even just the cover. It was the inside. The way she formatted the t title chapters, she threw in a poem that I never, you know, I sent it to her kind of jokingly. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, she included my poem. <laughs> you know, just she made the whole entire product beautiful. 
And I, I don't know that an agent can do that unless the publisher already sees that they have so much, so many sales available. That's a huge learning curve for all of us writers is mm-hmm. that there's this business side to the industry. It's so, it's not the same as writing. Mm-hmm. And Eva has, and the book Khaleesi, they, her, she has it. She understands what needs to be done to launch Envy. Yeah, it's almost like she takes everything and basically takes care of it as if it were her own, which is something that a lot of people would do if they really cared about something. And so, yeah, congrats to her. Congrats to you. And now in your book, Life Happens on the Stairs, your main character, Elsie Richardson's world completely crumbles. When she realizes that her father's brain tumor has returned, Elsie is forced to grow up quickly. What obstacles does she face in the book? The biggest, of course, is the fact that her father is, you know, it's terminal. And Mm. the reality of all that just kind of comes crushing down on her and her mom. The next uh, reality that comes to life is that her brother is coming home and they have Elsie and her brother, Mark, are, they just, they have baggage. And even though they were close growing up, Elsie made some mistakes, Mark made mistakes. And he is, at the time, is living with his grandparents in Illinois, but they live in Tennessee. And so Mark needs to come home because, you know, dad's so sick. Um, from there, it, it, Elsie just gets it piled on all of, at once. Claire, her mom, needs help to make ends meet and she cleans houses for the wealthy in the area. And um, she needs Elsie to step up. Elsie's 17 years old, almost 18. It's like, look, it's the summer. I need you to go do some things so I can be with your dad at the hospital. And then her biggest challenge on some levels is herself. Um, She is her own worst enemy. And so she meets this boy that is, the grandson of her mom's wealthiest client and Tyler he's charming and he asks her to meet him at Shiloh National Military Park to go jogging he's a cross-country runner and Elsie's not thinking anything of it she's like "Eh," a little reluctant but she's (laughs) like sure I'll meet you and Then, you know, within an hour, she's with her mom later, and she's like, you do realize that Tyler's off limits. You cannot be with this boy. I need this job. Mm -hmm. And so that's when Elsie's lie begins. She's determined to see him. And so Tyler becomes this balance um, in the story. And But yet, Elsie, she even puts obstacles in her own way. She mm-hmm. doesn't even mean to, but she does. <laughs> you know, and that's a funny thing, too. I mean, you have elements of family that really, especially around this time of the year, kind of come out. They they, they kind of come to the surface, especially like with, with brothers, sisters, aunts, uncles. It may be, uh, you know, there's divorces in the family and and it's really hard to get everybody to come together during Thanksgiving and Christmas and, and, and the holidays because there's always some kind of bad blood be, between somebody in the family where you just kind of have to say, you know what, do we work this out or do we just completely stay angry at each other? And it seems to me like you that you've taken a lot of life experiences from this just because it's so real. Now, that's my leading up to my next question here. Did you have elements in your own life that reflect Elsie's character? Yeah. Um, Elsie is, Elsie is aspects of, of my childhood. Um, when this story was inspired by my parents and what they went through at basically my age, I'm 42 now, but my dad passed away when I was, and when he was 41 and I was 12, but, um, thank you. When, so I wanted to tell the story of what we went through. We lived in this area of Tennessee, but at the time I was five, six years old. And um, fast forward to me being 38 and my kids are, you know, I don't even know the math there. They're like 13 and five or something. And I'm like, wow, look at what mom went through. I cannot imagine losing my husband at this point 
to a brain tumor. I'm raising kids, cleaning houses. And so I, I wanted to spill that into a story without it being a memoir. Um, so every, I have to say everything about this story, it doesn't sound like it, but every scene is fiction. No, not one scene in the story actually happened for real, (laughs) but my dad was dying of a brain tumor. Um, he was a pepper farmer in Tennessee. He was trying to do his own thing. I think he had a sense of urgency, like he knew something was going on. Hmm. And so um, he had, you know, has, he was kind of an art, artist in his own right and um, just trying to find what fit him best. Uh, his passion was, uh, he was a florist. And, but we end up in Tennessee in the situation. And um, so I, as a, as a six-year-old, when my mom said, we're moving back to Illinois, I was heartbroken. The rest of the family, like, went crazy. They're like, yay. I'm like, no. (laughs) I like it down here. (laughs) But I was low man on the totem pole. I didn't get a choice. And so it was one of those things that, like, how can I tell this story without exposing the family in a way? Mm -hmm. And so I made Elsie a teenager and then I was able, and I'm, a, I'm an artist as far as painting and drawing. It's not really my strong point versus writing. But so I poured some of that into Elsie. The emotions um, towards losing your dad, you know, having, I have two older brothers. You know, we've had some conflict, nothing mm-hmm. like what I put in the book per se, but it is, you write what you know. And so I did pour a lot of myself into Elsie and really all of the characters have a little bit of aspect of Claire, the mom for sure, because Mm -hmm. I'm a mom and um, trying to just balance everything. I was able to, you know, put that emotion into a lot of characters. Yeah. It's kind of funny how as a mother, you would write differently, you know, in a way, because it's almost like you're taking on both roles as the daughter Mm -hmm. and the mother, only because you've had the life experiences. You know what I'm saying? Like you look back on your mother's experiences and say, you know what? I know why she reacted the way that she did. You know, I know why she felt the way she did. And I'm starting to see a little bit more. Most people, when they get older, they, they get closer to their family when, you know, when they're teenagers and they're running amok, you know, and, and they, yeah. they get into fights and things like that. Once you come back and you realize, oh, man, I realize why my dad said that. I realize why my mother mm-hmm. said that. I know why the situation was that was going on. I know the entire experience. Why? Because I could feel those same emotions, too. And really, you've done a very good job in, in building that up. And, and like you said, you don't want to reveal too much about your own family. And that's totally acceptable. But when you live a life, it's going to come out in one way or another. And thankfully to all of your fans, it's come out in this book, you know, because they're going to take a little bit of that away too. So. And it it, is in the local response. I was so afraid to put this out there. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, you know, I, Claire is a Diefenbach. You know, I'm very German. I married a German. (laughs) I come from a German (laughs) community and I'm like, but there are no not there are no Dyson box in the area. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I will say that I found a very you know like not local name, but it is you know I it was intimidating to think that one of the people that I was very intimidated to have read the story was my uncle. I have one surviving uncle from my dad's side, and if his reaction has made it all worth it. Really? Um, he, he blessed me so deeply in just being able to, um, the way he seemed to understand that, you know, this wasn't our, my mom and dad's story per se, um, but it did give him a glimpse into our life. And he, it was beautiful. I, I will forever be grateful for it. And if that's why the story needed to be written, then it was worth it. Um, the, um, and, and beyond that, the response that I've gotten locally, 
I, I cannot express how grateful I am and at the support. I was relying on Twitter going into this. I'm like, mm. nobody knows me. <laughs> I can promote it on Twitter. It'll all be <laughs> fine. And, and it worked out to where like the party went to Facebook and people are like, but we know you. And I'm just <laughs> so, <laughs> so it is, it's hard to put your personal, your feelings, what you're going through personally into it. You don't want to hurt anyone. And we all know that authors have made mistakes in the past with such things. Um, that the last thing you want to do is expose something or hurt people mm-hmm. along the way. And, and that wasn't the intention of the story, of course, but it, you just don't know what kind of reaction you're going to get. Yeah, it, it is kind of difficult, but I'll tell you one thing. The experiences that you have are not completely just yours. When somebody reads a story, Mm -hmm. whenever they read a book, and I've said this about readers everywhere, okay, they're more compassionate about other people. And the reason for it is they live these lives through the words of an author. They, They understand different points of view. They can put themselves into other people's shoes. And so when they see an experience like your experience, they take a little bit of your experience and attach it to something that they've had. And that, for one, makes a great character. But it also helps people be a little bit more compassionate about other people. Um, you can tell a reader just by the way that they come out and they are more compassionate towards other people. People who don't read, you can just instantly tell that they are blocked off. They don't think about anybody but themselves, and they're completely shut out from the world. And it's so sad. But just like I was saying before, your little story may help somebody else get through their hard time in life. So I commend you for that a lot. Um, no, thank you. And I love the way that you put that because you're, I, I can sit here and like, I'm like mentally identifying non-readers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty I'm sad. Like, that? Yep, that person <laughs> doesn't read and that person doesn't read. Yeah. And so, yes, that is the beauty of a story. We all have a story to tell. Mm-hmm. Um, some people would prefer to just speak it than to write it, but we all have a story. And the whole point in stories is relating to each other. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm not any different than you. You think I'm living, a person thinks I'm living a quote unquote kind of life, whether good or bad or whatever. But until you know the circumstances surrounding where a person is, you can't judge them. Mm-hmm. We're all going through something. Mm -hmm. And we've all gone through something. And so that is ultimately when I was in this void of editing and trying to figure out what to do with this, with life happens on the stairs next, because of course I'm getting rejection after rejection from agents. It's just painful. And you're just like, what do I do next? I, you know, I just want the reader to feel what I feel when I write the words. Mm -hmm. And I will still cry when I read this. (laughs) And so when I have people come to me and say, I laughed, I cried, I bawled. I can't believe the words that you said at this point. I mean, those, it's just priceless. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot express my gratitude for the readers and how they have responded. Yeah, it, it is amazing. Now, Tyler Vaughn, okay, he's that secondary character in your book. Um, he builds up a relationship with Elsie, okay, and it's almost as though she's really kind of relying on him to take on this load of all the stuff that she's going on just through, you know, just talking to each other. Now, did you have anybody in your life that, that you were able to just talk to and get things out? No, and I think that that is part of why Tyler was born. Mm-hmm. Um, he, on some levels, he was my response to some popular fiction that I had read to where uh, I just wanted to convey what a gentleman looked like. Mm. Like if I was a guy, what kind of guy would I want to be? <laughs> um, and so there is a lot of me in Tyler in that sense, even though I'm a female, it's just, it's, you know, I, I kind of poured like, what's the ideal guy. And uh, because Tyler is gritty too, he's a gentleman but he, he's no nonsense. Mm-hmm. He's very, very intelligent. He's perceptive. And so he doesn't, 
Um, I'm not saying I'm all those things. I'm just saying <laughs> that's when I made him. <laughs> but at the same time, I he um, Tyler was necessary for the story in my mind because the, the initial storyline is so heavy. Mm-hmm. You know, I literally had a judge from one of the Romance Writers of America contests. I don't know which one it was. There's so many across the country. <laughs> but basically say, you know, she was like, dad sick, dad dies, end of story. What you got? And mm-hmm. I mean, I was just like, that is a really raw way to critique. <laughs> and, um, and so I needed something more, you know, I did not set out to be a romance writer. Mm-hmm. However, you know, that balances the heavy of losing your dad. Everyone in the family is just in a, you know, they're just going through a season that is awful. And we all go through those seasons. Um, and so Tyler was necessary in that sense. Yeah, I hope that, that answered your question. Oh, it's it's an excellent answer. And honestly, it really makes a lot of sense. I mean, personally, like I go through things all the time. I have things that, you know, I have conflicts in my own mind where I'll have to kind of talk myself through them and, you know, have that other side of me that says, you know, and, and I hate to say this, it's almost like having an imaginary friend. You know, and I don't know mm-hmm. if maybe it's just because I'm a Gemini or I haven't taken my meds, but no. <laughs> but, <laughs> That's awesome. I'm a Taurus. So oh, can feel there you go. <laughs> but <laughs> but what right. it is, it's, it's like having that person that you can talk to and just say, you know what? I, I want to do this. I want to do this. What should I do? Mm-hmm. And there's there's always – my brain is constantly thinking of a million different scenarios at a time. And as a writer, I'm sure you are yeah. doing the same exact thing because you got to have something to bounce ideas off of. You have to have something to, to take your character along the ride and say, okay, not everything they're going to agree with. And sometimes they're going to agree with things. And sometimes it's just that shoulder to cry on. And if that mm-hmm. turns into a romance, it even makes it better because it starts out like – almost as a friendship and really everybody out there would love to have that type of relationship where it just starts out as a friendship. You you, you start to trust, you start to fall in love and it does really impact a story. And so, you know, those people that were talking about your story, just being, you know, father dies and all this, it's like, really? Um, This is the spark (laughs) that, this is the spark that keeps this story rolling. You know, and it's it's a perfect addition to what may have been like your original draft. But this addition is is great because it really does give that character, Elsie, almost an extension of herself, not not Mm -hmm. like a mirror image, but some way for her to talk out her ideas, get them to the reader's mind and have the reader also kind of change their ideas about what's going on, which is, you know, they say that in books all the time, that if you have a storyline that changes the character's motivations or they, they come to a resolution by the end of the story that changes them personally. That's, that's a great story. When you take a book and you write a fictional story and you change the reader's mind about how something happens, that's impactful. That's not just a good story. That's something that really hits home to your reader. And when somebody closes that cover for the last time says, wow, you know, I saw myself in that book more than, than I think, I've ever seen myself in any book just because it was so real to life. And Amy, that right there is is exactly what a real true life author does is they take their story, no matter how hard, no matter how difficult it may be to tell. And they make not only the character change, they also make the reader change. And it's amazing what you've done. It really is because, I mean, you kind of came out of nowhere doing this stuff. And um, I love what you just said. I cannot <laughs> thank you enough for it. <laughs> anyway, exactly, because I've gotten some feedback on that mm-hmm. from from readers. You know, uh, that's one of the caveats of being a writer. You all of a sudden you've got this piece, and then it's just like, now what do I do with it? Who's going to read it? And now that you know, Eva facilitated this, the Breakthrough Novel Awards did. I've, I've got all of this feedback coming in that of just like, wow, I can't quit thinking about them. Um, this is going to stick with me for a long time. These are quotes from readers that I'm just, you know, my dad died too. And I, I was so related to the main character. Last night on Facebook, I heard, you know, I felt every step that Elsie was in. And, you know, I, was, I felt like I was her. 
mm-hmm. I, I was just blown away. I'm like, okay, you cannot give me any better feedback than that. Mm-hmm. And that's a writer's dream is that you feel the, that the reader feels the same thing that you do. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And, and the fact that they're already putting themselves in somebody else's shoes, it, it just gives you yes. hope for the future. You know, it really does. It makes, it makes you feel like, you know what? Yeah, there are good people out there. And yeah, there are people yeah. who go through the same things that I go through. And yeah, you know what? Sometimes it takes a book for them to realize it, but darn it, you know, maybe that's all it needed, you know, was, was some words of encouragement at the end of this book that kind of resolved the, the situation. But anyhow, I have some more questions for you. Sure. <laughs> we could keep going yeah, on forever <laughs> about this because your book is really right. excellent. Um, so now, Thank you. Now you ha- you have written poetry. Uh, a poet or a poem was added into the beginning of this book that you wrote. Would you mind reading that to us? I sure will. <laughs> I, I I found it very sweet that uh, Eva put it in because to be honest, I'll give you a little bit of backstory. We were trying. She was like, "Amy, I need a blurb. I need a back cover blurb." And I'm like, "Okay." <laughs> I really struggled with this and. Um, so one night I just kind of whipped out this poem and she was like, you know, this is fantastic and I will use it, but this is not a back cover blur. <laughs> I'm like, I know, Eva, <laughs> I'm trying here, you know? <laughs> and so, okay. So I was very surprised when she put it into the book, hmm. very pleasantly surprised. So here it is. Um, life gave her an assignment when she didn't choose. Lost for answers, she felt beaten and bruised. The days dragged on, hopeless and dark, until she met the one who lit a spark. She needed a place, somewhere to hide. He professed his devotion, yet she lied and lied. She was stuck in adulting, forced to be strong. Time was ticking, her dad didn't have long. Ashamed and embarrassed, she could barely breathe, torn between family and a companion she needs. Wow. And that kind of sums up Elsie's situation. Yeah. And honestly, if if anybody who's out there who's listening, I'm sure that there's somebody out there who's heard just this poem just now. And if this hadn't have been turned into a book, they would have been able to relate just to that poem. You know what I'm saying? Like, it really does resonate. And because, like, you don't <laughs> mention names, you know, so it kind of it's easy yeah, to resonate. Right. <laughs> but um, but it really does kind of just resonate with people. I mean, there's so many people that I knew growing up that that were kind of like forbidden from dating people because they weren't like mm-hmm. part of the same social class, you know. And it was just it was kind of bizarre. And then obviously, you know, the thing harkens back to Romeo and Juliet almost to a T. And one of yeah. the best best stories ever written about social classes uh, causing conflict between romantic partners, that right there is a real thing, and it's still going on. And that's the reason why that story resonates through the years, just like your story resonates with so many people, because it is something that happens. You know, people look at social classes, and they think that it's it's what we are. It is what makes us who we are. But then when they read yeah. a book like yours, and they say, wait a second, Maybe I shouldn't be so focused on social classes. Maybe I should be more focused on the people who are good to me. And that's really all you need to worry about. You know what I'm saying? Right. Exactly. Yeah. So and now, it, and my mom, my mom was a housekeeper growing as I grew up, um, and that influenced a lot of this. To be honest, I clean houses on the side, you mm-hmm. know, just to make a little extra cash here or there. So that was great fuel for you know the fillers in between when Elsie's frustrated and that kind of thing. But it ultimately came down to when I created Tyler. Um, I thought to myself, what would my mom have done had I fallen in love with, and this could have happened, even, believe me, it didn't, but it, it was possible <laughs> on some levels that what if I would have fallen in love with one of her client's sons or cousin, you know, something that would have conflicted with her bread and butter. Mm-hmm. She was a single mom. She had to do what she needed to do, and that sparked Tyler. It, you know, like I said, it's completely fiction, but it was just like, oh, mom would not have been happy with me. It would have been <laughs> <Yes>. bad. <laughs> and so, and that's, you know, and then that in writing a villain, which Mrs. Vaughn is, you know, she's my antagonist. She was 
so much fun to write. She is based <laughs> off of no one, but it was just like you could put anything, oh, not good into her. <laughs> it was it was like this is my evil side. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so she was a lot of fun to write. Mm-hmm. So much of your book's success was actually attributed to pre-marketing. Now, do you find that marketing your book before it's released was helpful to drive sales? I do. I love seeing, and that, I got to give that back to uh, Eva completely. <laughs> I This was, um, I wouldn't have known how to do it. And she taught me so much in the past few months. Um, you know, the cover reveal, cover's coming, let's do the teaser. Mm-hmm. And then these beautiful promos she came out with at the, uh, at, you know, the last minute before it was released. We sold a good, I don't know, I think we were up to almost 50 copies wow. before it was released. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't think that's too bad for no. an unknown writer, you know? That's really good. I mean, it's really good. <laughs> it, it, it was pretty cool. And so she's, Yes, the pre-release side of things, the marketing side of that, um, once again, was Eva's brilliance, but it taught me so much of what I need to do on the next side of things. Mm -hmm. Um, And hopefully we'll have her by my side is the goal. Yeah, and and really, though, I mean, you think about it. With all the movies that are out nowadays, how many times have you sat there in a movie theater and you see a trailer coming up, and granted, the trailer says it's coming out uh, summer of next year, and you're just glued to the screen. You're just like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe they're actually going to make a movie of this. Um, Yeah. uh, The Wrinkle in Time, I was glued to the screen. I was just like, are you kidding me? They're making the Wrinkle in Time movie? No way. You know, and it was just like, I had kind of heard about it, you know, because I'd read the book, obviously. But anything like that, Mm -hmm. uh, especially when Harry Potter first came out, and this was years ago, I was glued to the screen. I couldn't believe it. I was like, I had just started reading the series. Um, I didn't realize how big it was. And, you know, most of the time, too, you you have to kind of wait until like the third or fourth book for something to catch on. This thing was like Mm -hmm. out the gate, ready to go. Uh, by like I think the third book they wanted to make a movie and then they finally released it by the fourth book they wanted they were starting the production of it it, it was just crazy that they were actually mm-hmm. producing books at the same time they're producing the first movie I was so blown away and really that right there is how you do your marketing is you get your yeah. audience excited you get your readers excited about what's coming up and I I think I actually had your book on um, pre-order because I saw Eva had posted it and I was like you know what yeah I'm going to get that on pre-order and so it was just awesome. like it was amazing because Thank when you. it did get released for one it's really cool when it gets released and anybody who's out there if you want to catch a good book uh, definitely wait and look around for those pre-release. You can actually search pre-release books in Amazon.com um, because it is cool because yeah. you just kind of get like, for one, you, you purchase it and then you forget about it. And then it all of a sudden pops up in your list and you're like, oh, wow, yeah, I finally got that book in. Yeah. So it is cool. <laughs> it is very cool. So check it out is. the pre-release books out there. Anybody who's who's uh, listening, Definitely check out Life Happens on the Stairs. You missed the pre-release, but that's okay. The book is still amazing. <laughs> that's all right. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thank so you. now, yes. so now, this is your first book with the independent world, correct? Yes. Okay. Now, do you have anything that's coming up in the works? You know that you might be able to give a preview to our poor sure, uh, audience here. I, I... Uh, right after I wrote Life Happens on the Stairs, I immediately went into another book. My family was like, really? <laughs> like, <laughs> I got to get this story down. And so I have a, another story. It's called A Precarious Lead. It's a it's about a boy who his parents are killed in a motorcycle accident. Um, and then he is forced to live with his uncle who is the president of a one percenter motorcycle club (laughs) he just really has nowhere else to go and this is such a different genre for me because in the end you know he realizes that the people around him are responsible for his parents death but he has to figure out who or why who who and why 
And so it it needs a lot of love. <laughs> <laughs> the first draft is written, and you know how it is with first drafts. You're mm-hmm. like, I don't even know where to start because... Um, you don't want anybody to read it and you're like, I got to <laughs> self edit to even get it out there. But after the feedback was from life happens on the stairs, I've, I've kind of got to put that on the side. People want more of Tyler and Elsie mm. and I want to give them to it, give it to them. Um, and so that is what I'm focusing on now is where Tyler and Elsie go from here. And Tyler is going to find himself in a very tight spot. And Elsie is, she's kind of skyrocketing in her own career. And so how that meshes, we'll see how it plays out. Um, But I'm really excited to give the readers more of Tyler and Elsie. I've been reluctant to do this because the first story was so personal Mm -hmm. and so much emotion um, lifetime emotion was put into life happens on the stairs. But I'm like, how do I, how do I add up to that? I'm not trying to be arrogant with that statement by mm-hmm. any means. I say that with all humility, but I have found that the readers that are giving me feedback, they love these characters. And so how do you create conflict and keep the reader engaged at the same time? And so there's a, I've got a, I've, I have a challenge here yeah. <laughs> and I'm up for the challenge. I can't wait to give them something more. Well, Amy, one thing about you is you write from the heart. Okay. And I think that that's what keeps your readers coming mm-hmm. back. Yes, it may be Elsie. Yes, it may be Tyler. And it's good that you started them out young, you know, because <laughs> then it kind of works, right. <laughs> works to your favor. Um, but at the same time, it's like really that heart string that gets pulled when a person reads your book, that is the, the, the trend that you need to follow. And I think you're doing an excellent job. I honestly, the biker story thing sounds like a good idea too, because I know that you're an author who could do it well and do it in Thank such you. a way that adds life events into what's happening. Um, and that's what your readers want. Your readers want a good story based on relatability and characters who fit into the same, you know, way they think, you know, I I don't know how to explain it, but the, the whole thing is, is, is that's what is your string of theme in your books. And, and I commend you for it 100% because not every author can do it. Some authors, um, they try to do it, but what they realize is that they're trying to match what is in the outside world to their characters rather than match their inner world to their characters. And then it just, kind mm-hmm. of funnels back out into society and then people realize, wait a second, um, I've been feeling that same way too, you know? Yeah. So, so yeah, I mean, I know it's kind of like hard to explain and it's the way I think. <laughs> but, but I relate, I know, I love yeah. the way that you're saying it in the sense that I want to, re- I, I really want to convey reality. Mm-hmm. Um, I appreciate sci-fi, fantasy, oh my gosh, fantasy, how do they do it? Mm-hmm. You know, um, they just have these expansive worlds that go on. My son's reading Aragon and the subsequent stories. That, and I mean, these books are 400 upwards of 900 pages. And I'm just like, wow, that is such imagination. I am more of a realist genre. Mm. I want to convey real life. Um, and I think of some of the, there's a new series that's coming out and I can't think of the name. It's not, this is us. That's a different one, but there's a new one that's very hot on it. And I feel that it is on the same lines as mine that you just to express real life. And that's where I like to go. Um, maybe giving something a little bit more trendy in the next segment to where it's not, I don't mean to minimize cancer in any way, but mm-hmm. it is a um, a storyline that everyone relates to on some level. Yeah, but it can you don't want to overuse it, mm-hmm. and um, so it's trying to find something that people can re- relate to in real life, and that's that's where I like to roll in <laughs> whatever that you just um, you're just the story is about. 
something that people can relate to because they have gone through it on some levels in some way, shape, or form. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you could have always turned this story into a fantasy just by taking Tyler's mom and making her into a dragon. You know? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I could just see that. Exactly. Exactly. I mean, they were going to be a unicorn in the middle of this, and we would have been, you know... (laughs) <laughs> I'm a more of a, you know, I, for, I'm not a romance reader. I'm like a Preston and Child. I don't mm-hmm. know if you know the Pendergast series yeah. that they write. I love Pendergast. And so I, I just want them to give me more, but they have a great catch because they only tell us a little bit about it little bit more about Pendergast every, t- every time. <laughs> and I'm just like, give me more Pendergast. And so... It's becoming that kind of author to where you're able to not, you've got to be careful though, because you can make your readers mad if you cliffhanger and like, (laughs) don't give them enough. And so, but I, I hope that, I just hope to keep conveying real life scenarios that people can relate to. Mm -hmm. Now I have one more question. Honestly, this interview has, has, really opened my eyes to a lot of things. I'm sure it's opened a lot of eyes to a lot of listeners and a lot of authors who are also listening. And I kind of want to just ask you, as far as like any advice that you would give a new author who's starting out, now granted, you are a fairly new author as well, but you've gone through that stage. You've gotten to the point to where now you can pat yourself on the back because you've published your your book. Um, What advice would you give a new author who's starting out? Oh, don't give up. Just keep trying. Um, Find a critique partner. (laughs) That was one of the beautiful things that I was given. I feel it was a prayer answered that, you know, a friend of I through the Society of Children's Book Writers and Illustrators, I managed to find a fantastic critique partner, Ann Spurgeon, and she and I sat down and picked all 40 chapters apart and she was raw and honest and she just said it and so I changed it and I needed that honesty and when we got into the rhythm of it I went from a bloated 140,000 word manuscript down (laughs) to just under 120,000 and then I was able to weed out the unnecessary phrases from there. But um, just don't give up. This industry is so different when you go on to the business side of things. Um, And I, of course, like most authors, wanted to be agented and here's your traditional publisher. You got one of the top five. You can gloat about Random Mm -hmm. House or Penguin or whatever. And, you know we are living in an age where we have the ability to just own it Mm -hmm. and do it ourselves. And as it's hard work, I have to think of creative ways to market. I, you know, if it wasn't for Eva and the uh, breakthrough novel awards, I wouldn't probably be having this conversation. Mm -hmm. So I do attribute 90% of this to just, put your book in contest. Mm-hmm. It matters. If somebody will finally see it, someone will eventually acknowledge it. And if you don't get that kind of feedback, then you know, you will get some sort of feedback to know what you need to fix. Yeah. It is about perseverance and endurance and just, you know, five years sounds like a lot with the book that I'm just now getting published, but it only took like, I don't know, eight months to write it. It was after I got it initially written that it became difficult. (laughs) Um, It was like, what do you do now? Okay. I'll start querying agents. Well, I didn't have a clue what I was. I burned so many bridges with agents (laughs) because (laughs) the book wasn't ready. And, and so it's a journey. It really is a journey. And my other biggest, piece of advice is don't bite on the first publisher that says, yeah, we'll do it. Mm-hmm. I mean, the small publisher that I was with, I am not trying to badmouth them, but at the same time, no one had read it. They weren't invested in it. I didn't have an editor. It was 
I hadn't, they were going to do the book cover essentially. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it was one of those that when I met Eva and this all kind of the serendipity of it all, um, it worked out. She, she was invested in the same thing as I was. And that's what you want out of an agent, a book manager, a publisher. They, you, they have to believe in your project. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very good advice. Now, we do have a game segment here on the show. And this right. is, <laughs> I know you're kind of nervous about this. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. <laughs> okay, so here's the game, right? It's called the Word okay. Association Game. But I've actually just recently changed that to like the Mega Ultra Super Word Association Game only to uh, show you the intensity of this game. This game is worth, okay. get this, 12 trillion points all right now Ooh. these these points you can't use them for anything you can't uh put them in anything and you, basically they're, they're worthless but it's 12 okay but <laughs> trillion worthless points so here we go all right here's how to play the game each player will choose 10 words okay you must associate each word with another word excluding any words that start with a particular letter and you have three seconds okay. to answer. Okay. I'm going to go first so you can kind of get the whole thing here. Um, oh, and as, right. a, as a little add-on, if you can't answer, just say skip and we'll come back to it. Okay? Okay. All right. All right. I'm ready. Here we go. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to exclude the letter G. So nothing with the word G. Are you ready? Okay. I'm ready. All right. Fondue. A cheese. Next one. Chicken. Okay. Chicken. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, geez. Fried. <laughs> okay, that's good. House, like a house that you live in. House. A house. Um, home. Okay. Skateboard. Uh... Oh, what's the name of the shoes? Um, <laughs> the shoes. <laughs> okay, my three skips. My three seconds is up. Okay, next one. Elevator. Elevator up. Running. Cross country. Okay. Galloping. Horse. Okay. Yellow. Fun. That's simple, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty. Yeah, I'm just picking letters and numbers. And, Okay. Um, okay. Right. Uh, opera. Oh, Puccini. Oh, God, you wow. <laughs> he just throws that right out there. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Next one. The very last one. Duck. You said G, didn't you? Oh. <laughs> you were going to um, say it. You were going to say it. I was going to say goose. <laughs> yes, I was hoping you, you would. Me. Oh. <laughs> Curses I've lost again. Okay. <laughs> okay. Very good. <laughs> All right. I'm ready for my uh, 10. Go ahead. Okay. Okay. You can't use C. Okay. The letter C. Okay. We have fire. Uh, coal. Oh, darn it. Mm. You didn't. Okay. Okay. Yes, I did. Because <laughs> I'm thinking you you're excluding C. I'm supposed to come up with something that starts with C. Oh, okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Next one. Uh, autumn. Leaves. Okay. Book. Title. All right. Um, admiration. Um, applesauce. I'm just, I'm just throwing out a word. Applesauce. <laughs> <laughs> okay. That, okay, that would actually be a point against home. me because it's not associated, but that's okay. Go ahead. <laughs> Keep going. <laughs> you said a right word. Um, Illinois. Um, Alabama. You didn't say corrupt, so you're good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> <laughs> Why would it be that? <laughs> oh, anybody from Illinois listening right now? Is <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, what was the next one? Okay, number six. Excellent. Um, acceptable. Okay. Ponder. Think. Good. Baseball. Basketball. Okay. River. Stream. Nice. And the last one, because we just have to go here, staircase. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> 
I choose excellence <laughs> for excellence. the last answer. Nice. <laughs> At least you didn't climb it. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> Did you write down words that I could have messed up with? <laughs> you know, I thought about that to begin with, and I was actually using the letter R, but C, I was hoping I would stumble you with uh, baseball and Cubs. Oh, You were supposed yeah. to say Cubs there. Whoops. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. You're probably not a Cubs fan. No. No. <laughs> well, like, anyhow, you won the game. <laughs> you won the game with 12 trillion unusable, unredeemable points. Yes. I know. I don't know what you're going right. to do with all these points. You can probably just stick them in a closet right. or possibly under your right. stairs. Uh, yeah. That was another pun. Oh, okay. <laughs> over time, they will turn to gold. That could be my next story. <laughs> yeah. They just mature over time. Um, but right. anyhow, anyhow, it was a pleasure having you on the show, Amy. And uh, I, I wish you all the best in your writing. I know okay. you're just getting started, but I really see you going somewhere. Um, if you can stay with Eva Lancaster, do it because she's doing great things Thank for you. you. Um, and so where, pe- where can people find your book? Um Life happens on the stairs. We are. I'm on Amazon. Um, you can just plug in "Life Happens on the Stairs," and you know it pops up about the time you get to "Life Happens," <laughs> and that's kind of cool because it's like, hey, there's nothing else out there that's hitting that. So um, <laughs> just plug in "Life Happens on the Stairs," and it'll come up. And I so appreciate you having me on the show. It has been such a pleasure talking with you. And I agree. If if I can roll with Eva, we're going to see nothing but success in the future. It's um, it's fantastic. So, all right. Well. But I'm also on Twitter at AJ Mark Stoller. I'm on Facebook, Amy J Mark Stoller. Just type in my name, and you'll you'll find me somewhere. We've pretty well gone with just. Amy J. Mark Stoller across the board. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having you on. Thank you so much. I appreciate you inviting me. So it's been fun. All right. And this is Emmett Blackwell signing out. Keep on reading and keep on writing, my friends. Searching the web for the most talented, creative, and intriguing independent authors. Lifetime emotion was put into Life Happens on the Stairs. The Emmett Blackwell Show, diving into the creative minds of sci-fi, fantasy, horror, and paranormal authors. Their fantasy is our reality. 